Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow, to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hey there, I want to start out by telling you a little bit about who I am, just in case you don't know. I grew up as a child with a great fear of death. Uh, religious beliefs like original sin, hell, stuff like that actually tormented me. And that fear of death, that thanatophobia, led me to a fascination with studying death. And I've studied death for actually most of my life. Suddenly in 2015, my then 15-year-old daughter passed from this world into the next. She graduated. She moved into the spirit world. And I got to tell you, I was lost. I was devastated. I no longer really wanted to be on this earth. And I can say that anyone who's lost a child or someone that close to them, like a spouse, I think you understand what I mean. It's like half of you left with them. All I wanted to do was to be with her again. But I had other responsibilities. I had a wife and a daughter. I had family and friends. And I quickly realized I could not just sit down and die. I couldn't just fo follow her in the spirit. I had to keep moving forward on this earth in this body. So I accelerated my studies. Since that day, almost eight years ago, I have dedicated my life to learning more about the afterlife, where we go, why are we here, all those things. And I've taken what I've learned and I've integrated it into my work. For the last four years, I've been teaching others about the afterlife. And today, I'm the host of the Grief to Growth podcast. I'm a life coach, I'm a grief guide, and I'm a certified grief educator. I also teach positive intelligence. I host a YouTube channel and I write about what I've learned. And I've recently lost a program, launched a program incorporating these principles into a curriculum that I actually guide my clients through. I speak to you today as someone who's made this my lifelong study. I'm a chemical engineer. I'm an engineer by nature and by training. I'm a very rational person. I'm a, I'm a skeptic. I'm not a woo-woo kind of person. I'm the kind of person that studies things. I take things apart. When I was a little kid, I would literally take things apart to see how they work. Sometimes things I wasn't supposed to take apart. I don't take things on faith. I've studied this a lot. I've studied philosophy. I've studied science. I've, subje I've studied subjective experiences like near-death near experiences, out-of-body experiences, after-death communications, mediumship. And I take all these things and integrate them into what I believe and what I teach. And more so, I've, come to the I've used all this to come to the conclusion, conclusion that I'm going to speak to you about today. So I'm 100% confident that we don't die. I am 100% confident that we are spiritual beings having a temporary human experience. And But I will say that this experience, while temporary, can sometimes be overwhelming. And often we have to be reminded of the greater reality, the overarching true reality, true reality that this is a temporary physical re residence that we're in, nested within a greater reality. So what I want to talk to you about today is home. And that's not home with a lowercase h, that's home with an uppercase h. That's our true home. Now, I've been on this planet long enough to have had several homes. I've had homes in different cities, I've had homes in different states. I've lived in apartments, I've lived in houses. I've had temporary homes, like when I went away to college and I lived in the dorms. There are even more temporary homes, like when you go on vacation. Like when you stay in a hotel for a week or so, you might come back to your room from an excursion and it almost feels like your home when you come back to the hotel room. But then you remember your true home is back in the city that you live in. But none of these places are home with a capital H. So sometimes it's a saying, even when you're on vacation, even when you're voluntarily away from home, you get a little homesick. You, you kind of feel like being back in your own bed, even though you're away of your own choice. Now, home, my point is this. Home is relative. For example, when I first moved to the house that I'm sitting in, I didn't think of it as home for many months. I would come back to my, my house and I would think, that's not really my home. My home was back where I lived for the previous decade. And sooner or later, it became to feel like home. And I remember when my daughter moved away to college 
And the first time she was leaving here to go back to her dorm and she said she was going home referring to her dorm. And I was like taken aback. It's like, that's not your home. But once we're in a place long enough, we begin to think of it as home. And that's true once we're here on earth. We forget where our true home is. We think of this as home and we settle in and we almost forget that this is just temporary. So what this world really is, I liken it to a trip to the physical, a walk in the physical, as Christian Sundberg says. It's a trip away from home. It's an adventure. It's an excursion. It's a learning experience, like going away to college. Now, I believe we live in a virtual reality. This is actually a simulation. And when I say that, I don't mean that it's not important. I don't mean that it doesn't feel very real. I mean, it's just not the ultimate reality. It's not the permanent reality. It's not the true reality. And I was speaking with someone about this the other day, and they asked me if I was talking about simulation theory. Well, I think it's more than just a theory. I think at this point, it's been pretty much proven that what we call physical is solely a matter of perspective. Whatever reality we happen to find ourselves in is physical while we're in it. Now, if you think about it, when you dream at night, you're in a reality in, in your mind as you're lying there in bed, but it feels very real to you. It feels very physical when you're in it. Likewise, when we're in this world, it feels very physical, and we think of the next world as non-physical, non-material. And I think when we're in the next world, we consider that world to be physical. So the physical world is the world that we happen to be in. So people often ask about the afterlife. Well, is it just mental? As if mental is less than physical. And I have to say here, my thinking has been greatly influenced by people like Bernardo Kastrup, who wrote a great book called Why Materialism is Baloney. So if, you, if you're intrigued by this idea, I encourage you to get that book. Also by a guy named Thomas Campbell, who wrote a trilogy called My Big Toe, The Theory of Everything. Um, I, I believe with all my heart, these are absolutely true, that consciousness is what there, all there is, and the physical we live in is not the fundamental reality. Everything exists within consciousness. Nothing is actually truly physical. So physical is what you are when you're in it, as I said earlier. And as I mentioned, when you're in a dream world, it's physical while you're in it. Now, it has a rule set, right? But they're different from waking rules. You can touch things, you can see things, you can hear things. You have a body that you perceive as physical, but you might be able to fly. You might have, in my case, a lot of times in my dreams, my legs are really, really heavy. And I was in this dream state. My legs felt heavy. I could barely walk. And I actually became lucid while I was in the dream because I realized that it was a dream because of that, that sensation I was having. Now, physicists have gotten to the point where they tell us that what we perceive as solid, this world that we live in, is not really solid. The chair that I'm sitting in and the chair that you may be sitting in feel solid to us, but they're actually not. They're vibrating masses of highly dense energy. What we call material is really just condensed energy. Now, the particles that we thought were fundamental at one time, things like atoms and then electrons and neutrons and protons and then quarks and then neutrinos and all these different particles that we find breaking down smaller and smaller, none of these are actually fundamental. At the smallest level, they're vibrating bits of energy. There's nothing solid about what we live in. When I was in college, we were taught that electrons were little tiny balls. They were these particles that moved around in shells. Now they're being taught as partly a wave and partly a particle. They're not really either or the other. And more accurately, or more accurately what an electron is, is quantitized fluctuating probability wave function. So think about that. When we think about things on a very small level, uh, we get down to the point where they're not really real. They're not really solid the way we consider things to be real. Just for example, a hydrogen atom is 99.1206% space. It's, there's not a whole lot there. So why do we do this? Why do we come to this virtual reality? Well, we come here for a time. We come to experience. We come to learn. We come to grow. We come to learn compassion. We come to learn wisdom. We come to expand our capacity. We come to improve our consciousness. We come here to evolve our consciousness. So someone recently asked me, if we're perfect, why do we have to come here to grow? Well, that's a great question, but what does it mean to be perfect? Think about it. What couldn't be improved? What is it that couldn't be improved on? And some people say we're omniscient in the afterlife. We know everything. Some say that once we die, we know all the secrets of the universe. But that's intellectual knowledge. And it may or may not be true that suddenly all these intellectual secrets are revealed to us. But to be truly omniscient, to truly know everything, 
You must know what it's like, what everything is like. And some things you can only learn experientially. For example, to be an omniscient being, to know everything, you'd have to know what it's like to not be able to speak English. And you couldn't know that, of course, if you could speak English. If you were never uncomfortable, you couldn't know what it's like to be to be cold or to be hungry. To know what it's like to receive mercy, you have to be in a position where you need mercy. So hopefully you get my meaning. Sometimes we come to suboptimal conditions, even though we may be these powerful beings, to have experiences so that we can learn by having the experience. So to have that experience, we have to enter this simulation that allows us to feel these things. We have to enter this simulation that allows us to be constrained to have these experiences and to learn what they're like. So I believe that we are fractals of a greater consciousness, that we are here on a mission to have experiences to grow that consciousness and to grow our own. Our own lives are in service to continue the evolution of this larger consciousness. The idea of a perfect, all-knowing, all-self-contained God that is omniscient and omnipotent is really only relative to our small consciousness. I believe in reality, no omniscient being actually exists. The reality is that consciousness, source, God, whatever you want to call it, needs us to grow. For God to experience everything, God fragments God's self into the, all these consciousnesses that have these experiences and kind of upload them to the, to the larger consciousness. So the reason why we can leave where we came from and come to this place is that we know it's only for a time. We know it's only temporary. We know that the experience is temporal. We know that no true harm can really come to us. But while the experience is temporal, while the experience is passing through time, the benefits are actually eternal. We, we retain this knowledge, this experience as we move forward. Now, everything in the simulation that we're in fades away when we leave our bodies. All the money that we accumulate, all the things that we collect, everything that we think we own, we're merely renting while we're in this body, in this projection, in the simulation. And we're even, our bodies are not even our own. They're also temporary. So again, why do we come here? Well, maybe there's more than one reason. I mentioned above, it's to improve consciousness. It's to actually expand our capacity to learn things. But there's more. When I talk to people about signing up to come here, many say, I would, I would never sign up for this. This is, this is just dumb. This is stupid. This is, this is way too much. But let's think about this from a different perspective. Earlier, I mentioned college. I mentioned that I studied electric or chemical engineering. Now, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I got my degree in four years. But I, and I actually paid money to these people to torment me when I was in college. And I studied chemical engineering for a couple of reasons. One was because I loved chemistry in high school and I wanted to continue my education in chemistry. One was another thing I thought I could do it. But part of it was I wanted a challenge. High school was really easy for me. I, had a, I graduated with a perfect GPA. In college, I wanted to stretch myself. I wanted to see what I could do. I wanted to test my limits. So I went into something that I thought was really hard, and it was. Now, I love reality TV, and there's a show on reality TV called Alone. And there's another show called Naked and Afraid. And in these shows, people put themselves into extreme conditions. On the show Naked and Afraid, they go into the wilderness wearing nothing, and I mean nothing. They have no shoes, they have no clothing, they are totally naked. They're allowed a bag to carry things in and like two items, like a pot and a knife. And the goal is to survive for 21 days. Now, when I explain this program to people that are unfamiliar, they say, well, they must do it for the money. Why would anybody do this? But there's actually no cash prize in this show. They do it for the adventure. They do it to improve their skills. At the beginning of the program, they're given a survival rating. And at the end of the program, they're given another survival rating after they've endured and hopefully overcome, after they've grown by going through this, um, through these extreme conditions. Now, another program I mentioned earlier is called Alone, and in a sense, it's even more extreme. Now, these people are clothed, and they do get some more supplies. They get about 10 items, but their supplies are still extremely limited. But they're dropped in, like, Canada, in the wilderness, as winter is coming, in extreme conditions. And what's more extreme about this program is they're truly alone. There is no camera crew. They're given camera gear. They film themselves. And the show is filmed entirely by the participants. Now, they typically last um, anywhere between a week and a couple of months. At least one person has made it to like 100 days. I think maybe two people have made it to 100 days. But in addition to the weight loss they go through, because they all slowly starve, 
there's another really profound change. As I've watched this program, and I've watched it over several seasons, pretty much every contestant I can think of has gone through like an amazing spiritual transformation if they've been out there long enough. The hardships that they go through, the solitude, make permanent changes in how they view the world and how they view themselves. It makes changes in their character. You know, some people are actually physically altered permanently. They end up with having things that they never recover from with, with both internal and external injuries. But spiritually and, and, and character-wise, they grow. Now, I also love sports. And have you ever thought about how ridiculous it is, how sports are? I love football. Think about grown men strapping on pads, going to, onto a field, throwing a ball back and forth, tackling each other, one team desperately trying to stop the other one from getting to a goal in the other end zone. It's a totally artificial construct. We set up this conflict where one team is trying to stop the other from scoring and they're risking life and limb. And we pay money to watch. And why do we do this? We do it for the challenge. We want to see who can do what. We want to see people put themselves to the test. So do you get my point? We deliberately place ourselves in challenging situations. We place ourselves in conflict. We place ourselves in painful and uncomfortable situations all the time when we're here. So why would we not have chosen this, given the opportunity there is for growth and for experience from a spiritual perspective? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the between life. We often refer to the next life as the afterlife. Well, more accurately, there aren't many lives. There is one ever life. There is one eternal life that we all have. Yet, it's broken into phases. And I've recently begun referring to the phase of the life, the next phase of life, as the between life. This, where we are now, is where we come between the times we're at home. So I view this life as kind of in between. We're home, and then we're here in between, and then we're back home. And I was speaking with a gentleman the other day, and I love the term he used when he described the day that my daughter left this world. He called it her continuation day. I love that term. Uh, I've heard the term risen used to describe people who are, quote, dead. They're not dead. A few days ago, someone said that their departed mother had moved upstairs. I love these terms because they're, they not only remind me that death is not the end, but the whimsy in them, the whimsical nature of them, remind me not to take this life so seriously, that this life is just our between life. This phase of life is not our real life. This planet is not our home. This is where we come to challenge ourselves and we come to grow. Now, The Wizard of Oz is a movie that, that grows more relevant to me the older I get. Uh, I love the movie and it's, it's just one of my favorites. But just like Dorothy and her band, band, band of adventurers on the Yellow Brick Road, we go through hardships that we go through to come out stronger. We all support each other as we make the trip back to home with the capital H. Now, I don't know about you, but I am not an adventurous person. The other day, someone asked me the question, what's the most, most adventurous thing you've ever done? And my answer was probably scuba diving. Um, I'm not into skydiving or extreme hiking or mountain climbing or even running marathons. Uh, I am not an adventurous person. But I will say this to you. You may not feel like you're not an adventurous person either. But if you're here, you are. I tell you, my friends, we are the baddest of the bad. We are the tough guys. Going back to Christian Sundberg, who wrote the uh, book, A Walk in the Physical, he has between life and pre-life memories. And in his experience, he talks about being in the prior life, the real life, I would say. And in this place, he comes across a being that just super impresses him. And what was different about this being, after Christian inquired of him, is he had had a physical experience. He had incarnated, and that experience had changed him. It had grown his capacity. It had made him a different being, and he thought it was really worth doing this, and that's why Christian decided he was going to incarnate, because he wanted what this being had. When I interviewed Natalie Sudman for my podcast, she talked about perspectives, the perspective that beings on the other side have about us who have incarnated. And this is what she had to say in her book, The Application of Impossible Things. This physical life is a unique experience. And it's as entrancing from the perspective of expanded awareness. It is utterly lovely. It is deliciously strange, challenging, and wildly exciting. The razor focus required to remain in the collective physical is intensely satisfying for a whole self, for the greater self. Physical reality is a balancing trick. It's a performance high. 
It's an intensely concentrated speed test of complex skills, where each an F-22 pilot flying 50 feet off the deck through an impossibly narrow canyon. So how does that make you feel about being an incarnated being? Does that make you feel proud? Does that make you feel like you've made it, you've had an accomplishment just being here? Now, again, I mentioned earlier when I was a child, my favorite movie was The Wizard of Oz, and it still is. I don't know why I just love that movie. It came out once a year. Now, when I was a child, there were no DVRs or VCRs. If you missed it, you waited till the next year. So I made sure I always was there to watch it on the night it came on. You may recall in the movie, Dorothy is on an adventure. Dorothy is taking a trip, and Dorothy feels weak and small and powerless. And she meets other beings that feel also feel weak and small and powerless. And they band together, and through the hardships they face, they realize that the things that they were seeking were within them all along. They go through all this series of stuff, and they finally realize that what they needed was within them all along. But they had to have the experience. They had to take the journey to reveal those things. They had to be tested to bring them to the surface. And what happens at the end of the movie? Dorothy wakes up in her bed with her loved ones all around us and realizes that it was, quote, just a dream. Now, there's a song by Stephanie Mills that's in the updated version of the movie called The Wiz. Uh, whenever I'm homesick, I play the song. And I want to uh, encourage you to go find the YouTube video and listen to the song. But uh, just to give you a little snippet of the lyrics. She says, oh, and if you're listening, God, please don't make it hard to know if we should believe in the things that we see. Tell us, should we try and stay or should we run away? Or will it be better to just let things be? Living here in this brand new world might be a fantasy. But it's taught me to love and it's real it's so real it's real to me and i've learned that we must look inside our hearts to find a world full of love a world like yours a world like mine when i think of home my friends smiling down on me giving me their energy when i think of home i think of a peaceful world and joy all around me and love that we share can never never ever be taken away when I think of home, I just sit down and think, and it gets down on my bones. I can hear my friends telling me, Stephanie, please sing my song. Now, this is a strange place we're in. This is a strange journey that we're on, and sometimes we forget while we're here. We forget that we're surrounded by people in spirit who love us. We forget our past loved ones, like my daughter, are looking in on us, sending their, us their energy. When we go home and we see them again, we'll say, Oh yeah, I haven't seen you in a long time. Now, I want to share with you a sign I got for my little girl on the fifth anniversary of her passing. I was taking my wife to a physical therapy treatment, a physical therapy appointment. And every anniversary of Shana's passing is a tough one. This was, I said, the fifth one. It was no exception. I wanted a sign, but I didn't ask for, dare ask for one because I didn't want to be disappointed. So as we're sitting at a red light, I was lost in thought. My wife said to me, did you notice what's on the back of that truck? And of course I hadn't. I looked up to see, I'm right here, stenciled across the tailgate. And in the upper left corner of the rear window was a sticker that said, Home. The message was, I'm right here, home, when I was wondering where my daughter was. Now, I want to read to you a comment I received recently from someone who had a near-death experience. They left this on my YouTube channel. While there, I went way out in the cosmos beyond the stars and planets, to where it was total darkness, though I could see perfectly. I was able to look back at myself from above myself. I was on tiptoe, leaning as far as possible over the edge of the wisdom of God, as one would do a wall to, or a well to, ways, to gaze down into it, as far as I could see. I was wearing blue jeans, and I was 23, though I was 57 at the time I died, and it had been years since I had worn jeans. I was face to face, eye to eye when I was healed. Though as first show my family as forms, once together we all had bodies and faces, and we loved as we'd always meant to be, laughing from that deep place of joy and the knowing that we were all safe no matter what. I recall trying to remember what it was that had ever made me feel unsafe, and I couldn't bring to mind one single thing. It's an awesome place of love and happiness because we are totally united, united in truth. If you're here today, and you are, you're here for a purpose. Now, I know it's a long journey, but it's a journey worth the adventure. And it will pay off in the end in ways that we can't even comprehend at the moment. 
when I'm feeling overwhelmed, I think of the words of Ram Das, who says we're all just walking each other home. And I'd say, let's walk each other home together. Let's hold hands. And when things get tough, just hold your neighbor's hands a little tighter and we'll all make it home together. I'm excited to announce I have a great new resource. It's called GEMS, Four Steps to Move from Grief to Joy. And what it is, it's four things that I've found that I do on a daily basis to help me to navigate my grief. And I'm offering it to you free of charge. It's a free download. Just go to my website, www.grieftogrowth.com slash gems, G-E-M-S, and grab it there for free. I hope you enjoy it.